Gigantia Blackbird for Grimoire. Welcome to Pagan Tales, the Yuletide edition. We are going to be discussing gods and goddesses of the Yuletide specifically, but also I'm making an exception to my usual rules and I am adding in an archetypes, well, two archetypes specifically with uh, Santa and Mrs. Claus. Uh, these are very familiar figures to us, uh, and they generally have a fairly modern origin story. Uh, the usual tale we hear about uh, Santa Claus is that it all began with a 4th century Christian bishop who was named Nicholas. He was later made patron saint of children, and he was known for his concern for them and people in general and his charitable activities. All very good. Uh, then Mrs. Claus, as we know her today, she was first mentioned in 1849 in a short story that was titled A Christmas Legend, written by James Reeves, who was a Christian uh, missionary from Philadelphia. And most people are content to take this at face value. And of course, you know, the Christian, some uh, amongst us in our society, you know, this is this is, this is is it for them. Uh, this is what they think of uh, when they think of these seasonal archetypes. Uh, but the question I'm putting to you is, is there more to it? Which course there is. So this is why we are looking at the deeper lore and thinking about the ideas that Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus really represent. Uh, first we have Odin. Uh, God Odin, he's associated with Yule and the wild hunt and even the leaving of gifts of, in children's boots. His Steve Sleipnir has eight legs and is known for his ability to travel anywhere. And I think that's probably a precursor idea of the idea of Santa's sleigh being pulled by eight reindeer, at least in our collective unconsciousness. Uh, and then we have some who associate Thor with you and gift giving. Uh, his chariot was pulled by goats, of course, and uh, this likely has a great deal to do with the custom of Yule goats, uh, particularly in the Nordic countries. Uh, but Thor was also the god of the common man, and he was known for his generosity and his availability to all. Uh, then we have Frau Holda, uh, who is possibly a version of Frigga. Uh, and of course, that depends on who you ask. And I've done other uh, videos uh, in previous years about that. So uh, if you're interested, look them up in the playlist. That's probably the easiest place to find them. Uh, but she was known for her love and protection of children, as well as checking to see whether or not all work of the household was completed before the Yule festivities began, and she would bestow gifts upon industrious households. And then we have La Bufana. Uh, this She's a less legend going back to the 13th century. And just because of her description, I'm inclined to think that she's possibly, even probably based upon older, if forgotten lore. Uh, she's known for flying around on a broomstick and giving presents to good children and lumps of coal to those who are naughty. Uh, so we see that you know, within pagan, the pagan framework, we have uh, several different deities, to be, I just mentioned a few right here, who are associated with this idea of seasonal gift giving and looking out to see you know, what people are doing and if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, so even the through, uh, the, you know, the Christianization era, you know, this idea, these ideas of these masculine and feminine gift givers uh, that very much remained in collective unconscious, which is why ultimately I think they were reborn in the modern era. So this brings us to the magic of it all. Uh, part of the magic of Yuletide and its Christian cousin of Christmas, you know, the religious version of Christmas, not the cultural version of Christmas, which we'll probably get into that in other videos. Uh, what this is all representing, at least to me, is the endurance of ideas that have to do with creating a bright spot in the bleakness of winter, and that there are personages who are looking for good character and good conduct and are wanting to, seeking to reward it and are even going out of their way in order to reward it. And what we've inherited with all these stories and it's just this really complicated tapestry of traditions in which various peoples and religions have contributed their threads and it's made whole that we know it today. And of course, this process of evolution, it hasn't stopped, it's still ongoing. Uh, you, know, you know, 500 years from now, you know, the things we're doing today will probably be added right all along into it. Uh, so the way I see it, that all of us and none of us really have a claim to the idea of Santa and Mrs. Claus and what they represent, uh, because these archetypes are speaking to something that's really deep-rooted within the human psyche. And I think they're very important, uh, because in our world, uh, quite frequently, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, so it's a comforting idea that there are magical personages or with divine or semi-divine origins who make it their business to do the exact opposite, who see that this is betrayed as a trend amongst of the people who are not virtuous, uh, perhaps people who are you know, just, they, they, don't, they don't care, they're too lost to pragmatism, they're too uh, lost to cynicism, and so you know, they, they distrust any kind of goodness, they have to, it has to be bad, and so the people out, out to do it, uh, you know, they, they, you know, they, they can't be treated well. Uh, so having uh, those who are wanting to do the opposite, uh, it is reassuring and it also it, you know, really 
behooves us to follow that example. Because goodwill in action, uh, for its own sake, is refreshing to the spirit, uh, whether we're talking about gods or humans. And when people are inspired to follow suit in their lives, at least see us over the time, because none of us are good all of the time, I think that does prevent uh, the outright cynicism of the rest of the world from poisoning the soil, the soul. So these are not small issues. These are big things. So this brings us to the idea of embodying the spirit of Yuletide, uh, because one of the delights that can be looked forward to each season is, you know, the sight of, you know, men there in their Santa suits and, and you know, and, uh, and, uh, and and then, you know, sitting down, you know, they're listening to children's wishes for presents and doing all of these things. And they're, uh, they're, uh, they're taking pictures with them and, and, you know, making sure they have a good time and, we also have an increasing number of ladies who will get all dressed up as Mrs. Claus, often, you know, with uh, cookies and cocoa to offer. And it's just this really beautiful, wholesome, visual reminder that the season is, is as joyful and as fun as we choose to make it and that we ought to look to our own conduct because, again, they're wanting to reward the good. And for all of the complaints about you know, the whole season being too materialistic, uh, there's really seldom anyone talking about uh, individuals and families actually taking responsibility for whether or not they are succumbing to marketing or peer pressure, or if they are actually keeping true to the spirit of the season as well as the realities of the family budget. It, really, it doesn't cost us anything to use the decorations we already own. It doesn't cost us anything except perhaps time you know, to uh, take you know, a bit of evergreen from an obliging tree if we can put it up in the house, and it doesn't cost us anything to take a brisk evening walk to admire the neighbor's displays. Uh, that doesn't cost us anything additional. It is just it's us making use of the resources we possess. And as far as the gift giving goes, they can be homemade at little expense, and that whole process is generally imbued with more creativity and love, and they can be very simple things. We don't have to have extravagant, extravagant gifts because a lot of uh, gifts of the old tide, you know, they're, if they're not practical, you know, they're it's just kind of fun things of the moment. Uh, so doing something that's you know low cost, that's just that's meant to be fun for the day, uh, you know, things like that. It's it's a little bit more practical, and I think it's a little bit more in tune with the spirit of the things because it's you're not as invested. You're invested in it for the right reasons. It's just supposed to be a little bit of fun. And of course, we can make more time for family and we can indulge in the telling of seasonal stories, whether they're ancient or modern. And of course, there's no harm in trying a little bit harder to get along. And to focus upon what really matters, you know, the state of our relationships with our families and our friends. So to finish up, uh, I would just like to put forward the idea that I think that Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus are really very unifying archetypes because every year we face that temptation uh, just to not just talk about the true origins of the holiday season, but to really throw it in the face of the people who uh, practice Abrahamic religion. So right now, I think they're super hypersensitive. I don't think it's really the time to be doing that. I don't think it's necessarily a neighborly thing to do. Uh, but also, as we are facing that temptation, we also have this annual opportunity to make the choice to focus upon traditions and stories we have in common or that are compatible with both pagan and Christian theology, which I think Santa and Mrs. Claus really do. And we can make the choice to make the year about enjoying company of friends and family regardless of belief system with no one making an attempt on either side to convert the other. I think that is something to focus upon, especially since there has been so much acrimony in our society lately uh, to decide, you know what, at least during Yule, that's not what we're going to do. You know, I'm going to fully embrace the Yule amongst my fellow pagans. And, you know, I can embrace the cultural aspects of Christians. And, you know, and, and I can choose to just not engage uh, with the other side if they're trying to uh, be a bit heavy handed with their particular interpretations. Uh, because, you know, their convictions are sincere. However, I'm not sure what phrase I really want to use here, <laughs> but they are sincere in their beliefs, even though you know, there are there are a lot of issues with their beliefs. And so I I think we can make a, a choice to be a bit kinder to them and to not necessarily respond with uh, harshness. Which means that maybe we need to be very careful about who we choose to interact with on social media, because the worst examples I see of really heavy handed Abrahamic religions, I always seem to encounter it on social media. So making the decision to perhaps leave them to themselves, at least for this season, uh, that's something that we can at least contemplate.
So Santa and Mrs. Claus, uh, they belong to us all. They promote generosity, kindness, and joy. So I really think we should let the idea of these archetypes uh, be our guide for the season going forward. Uh, so that's what I have for them in relation to the Yule Tide. Uh, next week, we are going to be talking about the Celtic god Lou, because he is actually associated with the Yule Tide. Uh, then the week after that, we'll talk about the goddess Fricka, her son Balder, uh, then the god Saturn, because of course we have a bit of that Romanistic Saturnalia influence that is also part of our larger uh, tapestry. And then uh, last week we'll be discussing the Norse as we're getting closer to the calendar new year and uh, you know, just thinking about uh, what fate has in store for us for the next 12 months. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, leave your thoughts for me in the comment section below. And of course, I will see you guys in the next one.